Thanks very much for having me. I'm really happy to be here. Um, unfortunately, I have a cold, so I sound really nasal, and I hope you can all um, understand me today. Um, so I, I, you heard the um, introduction. I'm going to be talking about non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Um, it's kind of a whirlwind of different symptoms, so hopefully you come out of it with um, a few pearls of information to help you in the future. Um, you heard of who I am. I'm a movement disorder specialist. I work at the Hamilton General Hospital. And I see a lot of people with Parkinson's disease. Probably about 60 to 70% of my practice is Parkinson's. And then I, other, I also see other things like dystonia, which is more twisting body movements, ataxia, which is incoordination, different types of tremor, myoclonus, which is jerking movements, and chorea, which is more wiggling movements. And in addition to that, I, um, I see inpatients in the hospital. I teach a lot of residents and medical students. And I engage in, in research. But uh, at this point, I'm just coming off from maternity leave. And so I must say, not much research at the moment. Um, I'm going to discuss the frequency and significance of, movement dis of uh, non-motor symptoms, um, a diverse array of non-motor symptoms, and discuss some management techniques for um, each of them. I'm going to be saying PD a lot instead of Parkinson's disease, um, and um, you'll see the term NMS for non-motor symptoms throughout the presentation as well. First, I want to introduce Dr. James Parkinson. Um, Dr. Parkinson lived in the kind of 18th and 19th century, and um, he was a good, very good um, doctor, but also a paleontologist, a politician, did a lot of different things. Um, but he wrote an essay called the Essay on Shaking Palsy, um, based on about six patients that he saw. And um, in this um, book, he described Parkinson's disease for the first time. He didn't call it Parkinson's disease. It was someone after um, him, a, me a mentee of his, that actually described it as Parkinson's disease. But in this uh, book, he described Parkinson's disease actually very well. Um, he described a lot of the, the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease, the tremor, the slowness, or bradykinesia, stooped posture, the gait, the shuffling gait. Um, Interestingly, though, they, he really didn't talk about the stiffness of Parkinson's, and that's because at that time, doctors didn't touch their patients, and so he didn't know that they were actually stiff. Um, there's been some criticism that he didn't pick up on the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's, and um, in the little description you'll see here on the left side, um, at the bottom it says, um, the senses and intellects being uninjured. Well, um, that's not really the case in Parkinson's disease, but he did actually describe a lot of the non-motor symptoms in his, in his essay, However, they were largely ignored until quite recently. So you know about the, the pathophysiology of Parkinson's disease, I'm sure, to some extent. Um, you probably know that dopamine is deficient in Parkinson's disease. Uh, dopamine is produced in the substantia nigra. And in Parkinson's disease, these, um, these neurons in this region die. And they actually, before they die, they, they get a substance in them called the Lewy body. And you can see one um, highlighted here. And this is the pathological hallmark for Parkinson's disease and really the only way to absolutely diagnose Parkinson's disease. Um, unfortunately, dopamine is not the only deficient uh, neurochemical in Parkinson's disease. There are also other neurochemicals like acetylcholine and uh, norepinephrine that become deficient. And these cause other symptoms in Parkinson's disease. The autonomic nervous system is a part of the nervous system that controls our bodily functions um, that um, are under unconscious control. And um, this can be affected in Parkinson's as well. And so um, these nerves lead to um, troubles with, uh, will lead to, um, so these nerves um, impact organs, blood vessels, and sweat glands. And so you can have problems in these areas as well related to Parkinson's disease. Um, a lot of you are probably very aware of the motor symptoms of Parkinson's. I just listed a lot of them here. Um, and um, they can be very bothersome for people. Um, a lot of doctors are also very aware of these symptoms, and um, they're often treated quite reasonably um, by um, physicians. However, um, there are also a lot of non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease, and I'm going to talk about these predominantly today. These include sensory symptoms, motor mood disorders, psychosis, cognitive dysfunction and dementia, disorders of sleep wake regulation, and autonomic dysfunction. Um, almost 100% people with Parkinson's, 100 of people with Parkinson's disease have at least one non-motor symptom. Now, other people may say that, oh, these non-motor symptoms are common. I have, oh, I have constipation too, and they may uh, kind of dismiss these symptoms. And uh, true, 68 to 88% of older individuals without Parkinson's disease also have non-motor symptoms. However, people with Parkinson's tend to have a large number of different non-motor symptoms, more frequent non-motor symptoms, and more severe non-motor symptoms. 
Um, Non-motor symptoms can be the presenting clinical feature or one of the first clinical features that a patient um, sees their doctor for in about 20% of people, or they may appear over even years to decades after a person has um, Parkinson's disease. Um, there is an increase in prevalence over the course of the illness, and interestingly, they seem to be a bit more common in people who don't have tremor. Um, some of them show a pattern of fluctuation, and this um, may um, sound familiar to you. So this graph is supposed to show um, how the symptoms of Parkinson's disease vary throughout a day. Um, as you may experience yourself, um, oftentimes when you take a dose of medication, the symptoms are alleviated for a period, and then the medication wears off and the symptoms come back, you take another dose, and then the symptoms get better, and you go on and on like this throughout the day. And as the symptoms wear off, it's, it's called a wearing off period. Ideally, this is not how we want our, our patients to be functioning, however, and I really try to get my patients to where they're more stable throughout the day. But fluctuations are very common in Parkinson's disease. And non-motor symptoms can have this fluctuation as well. Um, non-motor symptoms play a huge role in the quality of life of patients, and there are some studies that show that they're even more important than the motor symptoms in Parkinson's. They contribute significantly to overall disability, and they are highly related to nursing home placement. And for clinicians like myself, they become one of my major therapeutic challenges when I'm um, managing people with later um, Parkinson's disease. They're often not addressed. Um, sometimes they're just not brought up by the patient and not brought up by the doctor. Um, sometimes the patient or the doctor has no idea that they could be possibly related to the Parkinson's disease. And sometimes even when they're brought up, they're not treated for long periods of time because they're deemed insignificant. Um, lately, there have been a number of questionnaires developed to help um, uh, patients and, and clinicians um, identify non-motor symptoms. In my own clinic, I've started to um, give my patients this non-motor symptom questionnaire in advance prior to their appointments with me for them to complete before they come and so we can discuss their pertinent issues. Um, non-motor symptoms not only affect the patient, but they affect the caregiver. They can cause depression and anxiety in caregivers, and they cause sleep disturbance because some of these symptoms affect um, uh, um, sleep at night. They cause isolation because oftentimes people don't want to go out if they're having the symptoms. And they cause lots of freedom for the caregiver because oftentimes a uh, patient cannot be left alone for long periods. Um, there are quite a number of different medications available for non-motor symptoms, and so it's certainly worth bringing them to the attention of your, your physician. However, you know, there's so many medications, and you know, Parkinson's motor symptoms require so many medications that you really have to think about whether the symptom is bothersome enough to require medication. So although we could treat absolutely everything, it's up to the patient to decide whether or not it's worth it, if it's worth the risk of side effects, if it's bothersome enough. So always keep that in mind. So first I'll talk about sensory symptoms. The first one is anosmia, or loss of sense of smell. This can be a really early symptom of Parkinson's. And studies have shown that actually 90% of people with Parkinson's have a reduced sense of smell. Um, and interesting, about 70% are unaware of this. Um, but with loss of sense of smell, we get loss of taste often. And with loss of taste, people often just don't feel like eating. And with this, they lose weight. And so this can be a major issue with, um, with, with weight in Parkinson's and related to just a lack of motivation to eat because they don't enjoy food anymore. Um, in, in research, there's lots of different tests we can do to assess for um, a loss of sense of smell. And um, uh, there's um, a lot, also a lot of things that in a, in a clinical practice like mine, I can, I can ask people to, um, to smell if I need to. Um, or you can try this at home if you want. Um, but um, there's no cure for this, unfortunately. And the best thing to do is, is really try to eat foods that, where you enjoy the texture, that have strong flavors, and that are least rich in nutrients. In my patients who are experiencing weight loss um, because of this, I often encourage them to um, eat high-calorie milkshakes. And it's always important to make sure there's nothing else going on. You can't blame the Parkinson's before you rule out other problems. Oops. Of course. Um, I should call your attention to the special diet allowance. For anyone who is on social assistance, um, there is a, a, a form you can get completed. You pick it up at the Ontario Works or the ODSP office and bring it to your physician, and this will help support the cost of the, the onshore or boost beverages, which can be pricey over time. Um, people also get sensory symptoms in their limbs, particularly in their legs. This can be tingling, numbness, or pain. 
And these symptoms can be related to, um, to their motor symptoms, actually. So people can get um, stiffness, for example, of their shoulder because they're not swinging their arm very much. They can get dystonia, which is more like, you'll see the picture there of the, the, up, um, the upgoing toe, the toe that's extended. And this is a, it's called dystonia when people have the stiffness and, and positioning of their toe. And this can be very painful for people with Parkinson's and affect their ability to wear shoes. And um, also, nerves can be affected in Parkinson's. Sensual involvement means the pain can actually be coming from the brain itself. And akasthesia is a sense of inner restlessness that people with Parkinson's can get that is very uncomfortable. Um, these sensory symptoms affect social and physical functioning. Um, and like a lot of other things, always important to rule out other causes, um, orthopedic causes like osteoarthritis and, um, and other things like that. Um, to manage pain, one of the um, things to try is um, your, your Parkinson's medication. Um, you may find that the pain that you have responds to your levodopa, for example. And so it's also, it's worth um, paying attention to whether or not pain diminishes after you take a dose of medication, um, because sometimes it is responsive. Um, I also use pain medications, muscle relaxants. For people who have dystonia, so that, that toe that's going up, um, botulinum toxin or Botox injections can help relax that toe and help people, and physical therapy can be important as well. Visual, the visual system is also affected in Parkinson's in some people. This is, this is really not um, well known. Um, this is just a picture of the, um, the membrane at the back of the eye, the retina. And um, these are all the different layers of neurons that are part of the retina. And some of these neurons do the use of dopamine. And so um, if you know dopamine system is deficient, you may have problems with your vision as well. This plays out in specific ways, however. So people with um, visual issues can describe impaired color discrimination. Impaired contrast sensitivity, convergence insufficiency, dry eye syndrome, and something called seborrheic blepharitis, which is um, a skin condition that affects the eyelids. I'm going to talk about each one of these. So impaired contrast sensitivity is, is, is when you um, can't tell the difference between um, things that are not very different in color. So certainly the image on the left, no problem. Black um, letters with white background, no issues with that. But when the letters are very light gray, you may not be able to see them properly. And this may impact driving, using tools, reading, finding objects, and mobility in low light conditions and be a major quality of life issue for patients. Um, convergence insufficiency is your, your, basically your ability to look near, and this is significantly poor in Parkinson's patients. And interestingly, it seems to improve a little bit with your, your Parkinson's medication, but um, this causes problems with quality of life as well, particularly with reading for some patients. Um, it's interesting that color vision is affected, and we don't really see this um, play out clinically that much, so people often don't really complain about this to me. But this is one um, uh, test that is done from a research perspective to um, start to predict Parkinson's disease and follow Parkinson's disease um, in, in people who are maybe at risk. So this is just a task where you've got to line up all the colors in kind of in a, in a gradation, and people with Parkinson's are, are worse at this task than other people. So seborrheic um, dermatitis is more the general term for seborrheic blepharitis. And this is a mild inflammatory skin disorder with scaly, itchy, flaky red skin. Um, this can um, be treated with, with um, topical corticosteroids or antifungals, and sometimes antihistamines can be helpful to reduce itching. With respect to mood and psychiatric disorders, um, we, we think about depression, anxiety, and apathy. These symptoms can occur very early, be one of the first symptoms of Parkinson's disease, or occur later on. These are very important symptoms for impacting quality of life, and I have, I have some patients who really suffer in this way with respect to their Parkinson's. Um, having these, these mood disorders often actually worsens motor symptoms and leads to more disability for patients. 52% of people with depression, with, with Parkinson's disease, have depressive symptoms, and these vary considerably. Um, but it's, it's always worth um, um, keeping this in mind and bringing to the attention of your physician if you're noticing these types of feelings. Um, there are a lot of non-pharmacological methods for trying to manage depression, people who are not interested in trying medication. Um, talk therapy with, with a professional can be useful. Um, there are um, even psychiatrists around who have an expertise in helping people with Parkinson's disease. Exercise is good for depression. Um, there's some interest, even my own interest, in using mindfulness medication, meditation to treat um, depression. And uh, this is when you, um, you concentrate on, on being aware of the present and avoiding uh, focusing on the, on the future. 
Um, repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation is of this picture here. It's a technique that's getting more and more popular. Um, it's used for treating um, depression and some other psychiatric conditions in people without Parkinson's disease, and it's being, uh, becoming more popular for Parkinson's disease as well. It's um, time intensive, and it doesn't have a particularly long effect, so it's something that has to be repeated, and there are only a few places where there's experts um, trained to do this. So I don't think it's going to become you know, a, a very commonly used um, treatment, unfortunately. I put electroconvulsive therapy on here because um, it's really for refractory depression, so depression that is not um, treated um, well by any medication or anything else and is hugely um, affecting a person's quality of life, electroconvulsive therapy can be effective. And interestingly, electroconvulsive therapy is also being shown to help the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. It actually is supposed to increase dopamine in the brain transiently, so not permanently, um, but um, it is a possibility for the rare patient. Um, medications, there's a lot of research um, on antidepressants for Parkinson's disease. There are some that have shown some benefit. Um, there still is a lot of work that has to be done, but there are a few different antidepressants that can be helpful, certainly in Parkinson's. And then Premapexol. Premapexol is one of the dopamine agonists, a class of medications used to treat Parkinson's disease. And um, in people who don't need Premapexol for their movement, it has been actually shown to help their mood. So it, um, occasionally I will use it in a person who's dealing with major depression, although maybe they're, they don't have any major motor symptoms that need to be treated. <clears throat> sure, did you, I don't know how many here. We will be recording the session so you can access it later today, so don't worry about rushing to write anything down. Um, so anxiety, anxiety is almost as common as depression, it affects about 25 to 40% of people. This can be more of a generalized anxiety or something like a specific phobia for going out in public um, or panic attacks. Um, and this is a key um, symptom that can have, um, be uh, related to wearing off. And so there's another one to really pay attention to when you're experiencing anxiety. Is it when you're medication, you're just due for a medication? It's very common. Um, just like depression, same sort of non-pharmacological approaches to managing it. And um, medication-wise, um, the antidepressants are also used. I mentioned the Parkinson's medications on here because, like I said, if, you, if it's related to wearing off, modifying your regular Parkinson's medication schedule may be sufficient to manage the symptom well. And occasionally we use sedatives like um, um, clonazepam and lorazepam, um, but we try not to really in this case. Apathy is a tricky one. Apathy is defined as an indifference of the affected person. They just lack an interest or motivation to really do anything. And it can be difficult to separate apathy from depression or fatigue. <clears throat> its prevalence is still about 40% in people with Parkinson's. And it's a symptom that the patient themselves often doesn't complain of. They're fine. They don't feel like you know, anything's wrong. But it's their caregiver that's highly frustrated. They've, they've lost their interest to do anything, and, and um, it, it really bothers the caregiver often. Um, there hasn't been much research in, in treating apathy. There is one study that suggests that ribostigmine, which is a medication used for um, dementia, uh, may be helpful for apathy, but the jury is still out on this. Um, but it can be a really challenging symptom for some people. It's worth being aware of. Um, hallucinations can be a major problem for people with Parkinson's disease. These are typically visual hallucinations rather than hearing something or sensing something on their skin. And they're often well-formed, which means that it's not just a color or a pattern or a shape that the person sees, but people or animals. And I have people who say they see their, their grandchildren at their, at their kitchen table or dogs running around their house or someone on their front lawn, things like that. So they're very descriptive. Um, hallucinations certainly can be caused by Parkinson's disease itself. This is, this is a, a classic non-motor symptom of Parkinson's. However, Parkinson's medications can also cause hallucinations, and so it's often a combination of the disease and the medication that someone is on that is causing the, the hallucinations. It's always important to rule out other causes, though, such as non-Parkinson's related medications that someone might be on, or infections or other illnesses. Um, urinary tract infections are very common and often cause hallucinations, so it's worth ruling out those types of treatable issues as well. Um, Hallucinations are considered the strongest predictor for nursing home placements, so they're very important and, um, and worth um, bringing to the attention of your physician. Uh, prevalence ranges from about 10 to 
And um, there are times, however, that I don't treat them. For people who um, aren't bothered by them um, and they're not impacting their life negatively, we may avoid it just because it's another medication with the potential for side effects. So I have people who, like I said, see their grandchildren, they enjoy seeing their grandchildren, it's not bothering them, and so we follow it. Whereas other people are highly distressed, they're seeing them at night when they wake up, they're fearful, they're, they're um, one woman who sees worms and bugs in her cereal, and we have to treat that. Um, there are a number of non-pharmacological measures that can be tried to manage hallucinations. It's worth keeping a night light on at night so people aren't in the complete darkness. Um, when you get up at night to use the bathroom, turn on the lights uh, because I find that is often the time that people notice hallucinations when they, um, when they see a shadow in the corner and it looks like a person. Um, open windows and keep the lights on during the day. Let the, let the person know that it's the daytime. It helps with the, their brain um, functioning fully. And avoid unfamiliar environments. This is when hallucinations are more likely to arise. <coughs> um, so in, uh, with hallucinations, rather than just add another medication, I often try to remove medications that may be contributing. And this may include Parkinson's medication. We do our best to leave the levodopa alone. Levodopa is the best medication for Parkinson's disease, and we try not to touch it if possible because if you start to lower it, people end up being worse physically and their quality of life is quite impaired. So if people are on medications like amantadine um, or any of the dopamine agonists I've mentioned here, selegiline or sagiline, these are the ones we try to at least reduce if not discontinue completely because these ones are more likely to be the culprit and having a low, uh, smaller impact on someone's functioning as a whole. Um, there are other medications that are used to treat the hallucinations themselves. It's worth me calling to your attention that there are some medications used to treat hallucinations in the general public that should not be used in Parkinson's disease. And I find that if someone has, is very distressed by hallucinations and they go to the, to the emergency department, an emergency physician may not be aware of this and may prescribe one of the medications listed here, risperidone, olanzapine, or haloperidol, and these should not be used in Parkinson's disease. They can worsen Parkinson's disease. The only medications really recommended for use are um, the, the ones I mentioned at the bottom, quetiapine and clozapine. Clozapine is a bit tricky to use. It requires frequent blood monitoring, so frequent blood tests if you want to be on it, and only certain physicians can prescribe it, so it's, it's quite rarely used. Quetiapine is the, the, really the main one that is, that is useful um, for, the, for most people with Parkinson's disease. I mentioned pimavenserin in brackets here because um, you, may have, you may be aware of this medication. It's new to the market. It was just approved in the States by the FDA. It's not yet available in Canada, but it works differently than all of the other medications for hallucinations and may not have some of the potential for side effects that all the other ones have. So um, I anxiously await this medication to be able to use it with my patients. Next, I want to talk about cognitive impairment. So there's, there's normal aging. As we age, our brains um, don't work quite as well as they, they did when we were young in the sense that um, oftentimes it's, it takes longer to um, remember words and to remember uh, maybe memories, and this is normal. Um, but sometimes people have abnormal aging, and um, when um, this happens, it can be called mild cognitive impairment. And this is when people have mild memory issues, um, but they're not interfe interfering with their general life. It's only called dementia when there's a functional impairment. So when people can't carry out their daily life, act life activities because of their thinking and memory problems. So, um, so okay, people with, with mild cognitive impairment, or MCI, notice some difficulty, but it does not impact their day-to-day -day life. At least 80% of people with Parkinson's develop MCI, unfortunately. It may be present at the time of diagnosis or can occur at any point in the future. And some of these people who develop MCI go on to develop dementia. Now there is a Parkinson's disease dementia, and I'll talk about that in a second. But people with, with Parkinson's disease are still at risk for other types of dementia. They can develop Alzheimer's disease or vascular dementia, um, which is um, when strokes in particular places in the brain cause thinking and memory problems, or mixed dementia, when you have multiple types of dementia. Um, uh, dementia with Lewy bodies is something I'm always asked about. Uh, dementia with Lewy bodies is um, very similar to Parkinson's, um, but the dementia comes first before or at the same time as the movement troubles. So in Parkinson's, people develop the, the, the memory and thinking troubles later on. The movement troubles come first. And so um, this is often how we distinguish the two. They're treated very similarly, um, but it's not quite the same as, as Parkinson's disease dementia. In Parkinson's disease dementia, 
Um, patients can have a lot of inattentiveness, so they, they still pay attention to their surroundings or to activities. They may have impaired judgment or decision-making ability. They may have poor visual spatial skills, um, which makes it difficult to drive and navigate. And they may have memory issues, although this can be milder than an Alzheimer's disease. And this is one of the distinguishing features between Parkinson's disease, dementia, and Alzheimer's disease, is that the memory is um, often not nearly as affected in the Parkinson's disease, dementia. Unfortunately, this is a progressive dementia as well, however. Um, to manage cognitive impairment, one of the first things to do is to remove any possible contributing factors. So um, mood disorders and other psychiatric issues can contribute to cognitive impairment, and that has to be managed. Um, treat any physical diseases, including providing pain control, as this can affect, um, affect um, cognition. And eliminate any other medications that can affect um, uh, thinking and memory as well. Um, there are um, some non-Parkinson's medications, such as medications to help with um, bladder function, um, that are really well-known culprits for causing confusion. And the sleep aids, like um, sedatives, also contribute to confusion for some. Unfortunately, the Parkinson's disease medication, the dopamine agonist, Premapexol, um, Repinerol, Retigotine patch, they can also contribute to confusion. And so when people who come to me with this complaint, I often have to reduce or remove um, this class of Parkinson's medication. I just wanted to talk to you. This is something I, I heard from a geriatrician, and I thought it was uh, um, just a great analogy for, um, for uh, managing or trying to, trying to do what you can to help with preventing um, memory loss and, and, and problems with thinking and memory. Um, so the first step is to consider your neurons like trees, okay? You're, so you, your brain is really a forest. And um, the forest, in, in a normal forest, all the trees are, are uh, the, the branches are reaching out and touching other branches of other trees, and all the trees are really connected. And this is your brain. Your, all your neurons are reaching out, and they have a lot of connections to other neurons, and this is allowing your brain to function optimally. Over your life, we lose trees. This is normal. We all lose, uh, lose trees, lose neurons in our brain. It's part of normal aging. Um, Things like having a stroke or having dementia lead, gives, leads you to lose more trees in your forest. And um, because of this, oftentimes the trees are so sparse that they lose those connections between them. Now, there's no way, unfortunately, to stop the, the loss of these trees. I mean, we don't have a cure for that. We don't have a way, even for normal aging. But by keeping your brain active, by doing new things, you can actually maintain a lot of the connections between the, the existing trees in your brain, the existing neurons. So, um, so although you can't stop the loss of these, these trees, you know, the goal is to keep those branches dense and keep them touching each other, all the, all the different trees. So ways to do this, try to learn a new language if possible. These are challenging things. Try to learn to play a new instrument, join a local theater company, learn to dance, try reading a different type of book or playing a new card game. I have, I have patients who say, oh, I play bridge every Saturday night. Well, your brain's used to playing bridge. It's, although it's a challenging game, your brain's used to it. It's not forming new connections. You have to do new things to keep these connections growing. Um, also, it's important to maintain good brain health, so treating risk factors for stroke, such as high blood pressure, high cholesterol, abnormal heart rhythms, diabetes, this is important to keeping your brain as strong as possible, avoiding smoking, keeping your alcohol intake low, and keeping um, ac um, active is very important. Um, fortunately, there are no therapeutic in interventions known to slow down or halt cognitive decline, so we don't have any medications that do this. We do have some medications available for dementia, not for that MCI, the mild cognitive impairment, but for um, when someone has dementia itself. These medications don't slow down the, the cognitive decline, but they mask it. And so you know, people who take these medications, sometimes their caregivers will say that they're, they're more like their regular self, um, or they're not, they don't seem to be progressing in the same way. But if they stop the medication, they would. They would go kind of become, um, deteriorate to whatever level they, um, their brain would have been at, unfortunately. And um, there are two, there are three medications in, in this class, but two of them have had a lot of research for Parkinson's or some research, including rivastigmine and denepazil. And so these are the ones that I use in my practice. Um, I have to admit that I'm not blown away by the results, and I don't think any clinician is. They, they help a bit for some people. Um, and they're worth a try. If they're not helping, we get rid of them. It's not worth being on them if they're not doing anything. Um, but for some people, they do provide some benefit.
They do have the potential for some side effects, as I've noted here. The big one for, for um, to mention that some doctors aren't aware of is the worsening of tremor. So if tremor is a major part of Parkinson's disease for you, it can actually worsen on this class of medication, so it's worth being aware of that. Next is talking about sleep disturbance. So there's um, a number of different sleep disorders that can happen in Parkinson's. Um, people can just um, can have insomnia. Um, they can have what are called parasomnias, which, which are other abnormal behaviors that make, drink sleep. And the major one is called REM, sleep behavior disorder. I'll speak about this in a bit more detail. People can have excessive daytime sleepiness and even sleep apnea related, related to Parkinson's. Um, about 90% of people with Parkinson's have um, impaired uh, or disturbed sleep. And the most common reason for this is sleep fragmentation. So they're just, they just wake up regularly throughout the night. This may be for a number of different reasons. A lot of people with Parkinson's have difficulty turning at night. It's a question I always ask my patients. And um, this is related to their stiffness and slowness at night. But if you've got to wake up to turn yourself, it's going to lead to a poor sleep. Um, oftentimes people have an urge to use the bathroom if they're getting up multiple times. Um, the medications also may cause side effects at night or may not work throughout the whole night and so you've got to wake up to take another dose. Um, and some people have what are called periodic lip movements that wake them up at times. And uh, the treatment depends on the specific issue. So REM sleep behavior disorder, this is something that um, can be um, very common. Now frequency reports is very wide. Some studies say 20% of people, some say as high as 72% of people. Um, but generally, this is a, quite a common symptom with people with Parkinson's, and um, oftentimes people aren't aware that it has any relationship to their Parkinson's disease. This is when you act out your dreams. And um, some people think this is kind of just funny, it's just kind of an, a, a curiosity for a night, but it can lead to major issues. It can, um, it can lead to people getting injured, or they can injure their partner, it can do destructive sleep. And so I take it really seriously, and if it's something that is um, impacting patient or their partner, oftentimes we discuss whether it needs to be treated. It's also an interesting symptom from another, um, for another reason, and this is a symptom that can happen years before someone has Parkinson's. So there have been studies that have shown that people who act out their dreams by about, um, if, when they're younger, they, if, by 25 years later, about 90% of them have Parkinson's. So if you have this symptom when you're younger, the likelihood of you developing Parkinson's later on is very high. Um, this is important because our hope is that in the future we have medications that um, slow or stop the progression of Parkinson's. And so if we can identify people in the future who have REM sleep behavior disorder when they're 25, and we know that these people are most likely going to develop Parkinson's, we can maybe be able to give them a medication or give them some sort of treatment that prevents them from ever developing Parkinson's. So that is, that is where research is going, and that is the goal for the future, really. Um, if treatment for um, this condition is required, um, the first thing that we really try is melatonin. You can pick up melatonin at any pharmacy or health store, um, and it can be it, it's quite useful for managing the symptom. And it's quite benign, that people don't typically notice any side effects from being on it. If this isn't helpful, then the, the, really the best medication is called clonazepam, which is a prescription medication, and um, it can cause daytime fatigue and confusion, so I, I only use this when it's, um, this is really a problem. Um, uh, excessive daytime sleepiness and fatigue um, are often um, misused as terms, and, and um, they're quite different. Excessive daytime sleepiness is when you have a lot of sleepiness during the day, where you really feel you have to go to sleep, whereas fatigue is just it's low energy. And so you may not be actually sleepy, but you just feel exhausted all the time. Um, both are common, and they can both can be present at any stage of Parkinson's. And they're often associated with other non-motor symptoms such as apathy, depression, sleep disorders, or cognitive dysfunction. Um, excessive daytime sleepiness affects approximately 50% of people with Parkinson's. And it can be a side effect of Parkinson's medications, specifically dopamine agonists. So a, a percentage of people with dop on dopamine agonists experience uh, sleepiness. And they can even go so far as to have what are called sleep attacks. So this is kind of like narcolepsy, if you've heard of that, where all of a sudden you fall asleep. So if you're a person who is noticing some sleepiness on dopamine agonists, it's very important not to drive because of this. And um, those, these are people I often have to, have to um, discontinue their dopamine agonists because it's just um, affecting their life too much. And levodopa occasionally can cause sleepiness as well. Um, good sleep hygiene is the first thing um, to pay attention to in, these, in, um, in treating um, this problem. And I've mentioned a lot of different um, uh, options here for treating it, including avoiding long naps. I know people are very tired um, during the day from not getting a good sleep at night, and so they take a 
three hour nap and that's just going to screw up the next night. So um, avoiding long naps is important. Avoiding caffeine after dinner, avoiding exercise in the evenings. Um, don't watch TV in your, bed, in your bedroom. Use the bedroom to sleep only. And if you can't fall asleep after about 20 minutes, get up, leave the bedroom, go do something else. And when you feel sleepy again, try again. So don't just stay in bed for hours, just rolling around. Um, and try to rise at the same time each day. This gets your body into a, um, a rhythm. <clears throat> Fatigue is present in about a third of people with Parkinson's, and oftentimes it's described as the most disabling symptom. It's, uh, people come in and they look great from my perspective, but say, gosh, they're so fatigued that um, they just can't do anything. Life is, 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 is miserable. Um, it tends to be worse in older individuals and those who've had um, Parkinson's for longer. Um, and it can be associated with worsened motor symptoms, worsened social and psychological behavior, so they just are worse psychologically, higher severity of depressive symptoms and other sleep disorders. And, they, and um, excessive daytime sleepiness um, can be treated by a number of different medications if this is a big issue. If someone is still working and they're, they're concerned about their performance at work or they drive a lot, and there are a number of medications that can be useful, um, and I think they're listed here. And um, I, I also um, counsel people to take regular short naps. I usually say rejuvenating naps. No, no problem taking naps. Just make them 20, 30 minutes. Just enough to kind of rest your body and get back at it. And um, people often find this helps if they take two or three of these throughout the day. Participate in exercise programs and the sleep hygiene techniques I mentioned. Unfortunately, there is, um, there's, there's not much treatment available otherwise for fatigue. Um, and... Um, this can be a, a really challenging um, symptom for a lot of people. Next, I'm going to talk about autonomic dysfunction. So um, the first one is orthostatic hypotension. So orthostatic hypotension is a major reduction in your blood pressure when you stand up. Um, now, for it to be diagnosed as orthostatic hypotension, it has to be a drop of the top number, the systolic blood pressure, by 20, or the bottom number by 10, or both. Um, and, um, and so if you see a drop of this much, this is considered clinically significant orthostatic hypotension. And um, this occurs in almost 60% of people with Parkinson's, but only a minority seem to describe symptoms of this drop. And there are a lot of symptoms. People describe dizziness, lightheadedness, blurry vision, confusion, sweating, nausea, weakness, and fainting. And uh, the fainting is um, one of the, the biggest concerns because these people are at risk for injuring themselves. Um, now, there are um, a lot of non-pharmacological ways to try to manage um, orthostatic hypotension, and this is the first step for everyone. I really try not to start medication. We look at doing things in the daily life to prevent the blood pressure from dropping so much that people feel dizzy. Um, avoid getting up quickly. So when you get up in the morning, a lot of people, they get up and they go to the bathroom to use the bathroom. And the uh, most important thing there is to sit on the side of the bed for at least a couple of minutes. And for people who are prone to dizziness, keep a glass of water by the side of your bed. And before you get up, drink the whole glass of water. And so um, and get yourself your blood pressure a bit stabilized before you get up and use the bathroom. Increase your fluid intake to about six to eight cups of water per day. This doesn't include caffeinated or alcoholic beverages. This is hard, I know. It's hard to drink that much water. And for people with Parkinson's, they may have bladder troubles too, which I'll talk about in a second. And so it's hard to get that much water, but it really does help. Add salt to your food. So I, I counsel my patients to try drinking bouillon or broth. So um, up to three cups of it a day, I tell them to make a big pot of bouillon. Chicken, beef, vegetable, doesn't matter. It all has the same amount of sodium. Put it in the fridge and just heat up a cup at a time throughout the day. This gives you a decent amount of extra salt throughout the day and can help with blood pressure. Um, compression stockings, these are really, um, you know, compressed um, stockings for the leg. They can go up to the knee or go up to the thigh. Um, hard to wear in the summer, but good in the winter. It can be very difficult to get on. I appreciate that. Um, but this helps the blood from pooling in the feet when you stand up as well. And then one other thing you can try is to raise the head of the bed by four to six inches. Now I've shown here, this is not about just raising the head, not the feet. So you can't just use a, a, a hospital bed and just raise the, where the head is. You've got to um, put the whole bed on an, on an angle by about 46 inches, which can be, you have to get some blocks um, some, um, to do that. Medication-wise, there are quite a number of medications that we use. Um, levodopa can um, contribute to um, orthostatic hypotension, and so can dopamine agonists. If the orthostatic hypotension began after uh, uh, starting levodopa or changing the dose of levodopa, we think it may be related. 
And you can try domperidone. Domperidone is useful in this way. Um, other medications are listed here that can, that can help. And um, um, we try you know, often fludrocortisone or mitogen next. Some of these medications can cause your blood pressure to be too high when you lie down. So once you take them, particularly the mitodrin, um, it's important to not lie down. So um, after you take a dose for the next a couple of hours, try and don't have a nap because your blood pressure can go quite high actually. Um, and, um, but typically, this is these are taken during the day and not at night. I mentioned in brackets droxidopa. Um, this is another medication that has quite recently been um, found to be effective for orthostatic hypotension and Parkinson's disease. Again, not available in Canada yet. We're kind of slow to get on these things in Canada, but this may be another option in the future, and it has been, um, has been shown to be quite helpful. And there's really, I think, um, the best evidence for it now. There's, there's, there aren't that many studies that have looked at this in detail in the Parkinson's population, so we're looking forward to droxidopa because some people are quite debilitated by this symptom. Um, I just want to highlight um, the, um, the issue with the salt. Now, I often tell my patients, add some salt to your food, try the bouillon, and they look at me with kind of a wide-eyed stare, very concerned because it's being hammered into all of us to avoid salt. I mean, that's something that we all, we've all been told. But really, um, it's not, you know, you're, not, you're not saying it's, it's a competition between whether you're going to have a heart, or heart attack or a stroke and a fall. Really, those, um, increasing your salt is not going to increase your blood pressure so much to put you at risk in this way. So um, I, I think you know, sometimes we're, we're too aggressive with, with managing um, blood pressure and avoiding salt. And some people need salt. And if, you, if you're at risk for falling, um, it's really worthwhile to try because it can, it can change your life if you have a fall and you break your hip or you, you um, hit your head and you get a bleed in the brain. And so this, people with Parkinson's have very serious injuries related to falls, related to orthostatic hypotension. <clears throat> um, to speak about bladder issues, um, there are a number of different ones. Some people notice frequency or urgency when they have to go, they've got to get there really quickly. Some people notice incontinence or frequent nighttime voiding. Um, about 25 to 50 percent of people have at least one of these problems, and this is because um, in um, this is one of those autonomic symptoms that I mentioned, um, where the bladder is more irritable in people with Parkinson's than in other people, and so when, even when just a little bit of urine is in the bladder, the bladder may feel it has to contract, and so you have to go frequently. Um, this is a symptom that can be caused by a lot of different issues, though, and so it's important to rule out medication, other medications, urinary tract infections in men, an enlarged prostate is a big culprit for causing urinary dysfunction, and so it's worth um, seeing your family doctor to rule out this as a cause. Um, and then in women who've had children, um, oftentimes they have um, issues with frequency and urgency just related to um, um, changes that have happened because of childbirth. <clears throat> for non-pharmacological measures, um, one thing to be, you can try is time voiding, which is going every hour, every two hours on the dot so that you never get to the point where you really have to go urgently. Um, avoiding fluids after dinner, but remember to have a glass of water by your bedside in the morning. Um, protective undergarments, using a bedside commode so that at least if you have to get up to use the bathroom at night, it's not as disruptive for you or your partner um, if you have something right beside the bed. And for men, they have a couple more options, a urinal by the bed or a condom catheter. Um, some people cringe at the idea of the condom catheter, which is really like a condom, and you, you put it on, and it has a tube that's connected to a bag, and so you don't have to get up from bed at all. Um, but for some people, they tolerate it very well, and, um, and, um, and this, this changes their quality of sleep. There are other medications for overactive bladder that I've mis uh, mentioned here. And occasionally, um, you'll find a urologist who will do Botox injections or, um, for um, overactive bladder. Some of these cause um, confusion in some people, so it's certainly worth um, um, avoiding them if you have um, uh, problems with thinking and memory already, unfortunately. Um, constipation is a major issue for a lot of people with uh, par Parkinson's disease. And it can occur many, many years before people develop Parkinson's. Um, unfortunately, it can be worsened by Parkinson's medications. Interestingly, um, some um, data to show that duodopa, the um, infusion of levodopa that some people get into their gut for Parkinson's, may actually improve constipation for some. This is an interesting study that shows um, that the frequency of bowel movements impacts your risk to get Parkinson's. So um, this, is, this was very interesting when it came out. So you'll see here that on the right, if you have a bowel movement every three days or less, you have a four-time risk of developing Parkinson's disease. So um, we don't really know if this is truly a risk, that you're just at risk, or if this is a really early symptom, and that 
we, there's some thought that the, 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 gut, the nerves in the gut are very early on affected in Parkinson's, so maybe people are just showing the symptoms of constipation much earlier, um, but it's certainly related. <clears throat> um, constipation affects quality of life significantly, and it can affect appetite and lead to weight loss. And a severe constipation can cause a kind of a, a megacolon, which is when the, the colon distends and does not constrict properly, obstruction, twisting, and even perforation or, or um, kind of a bursting of the bowels. Um, lots of different management options for constipation, which I'm sure a lot of you are aware of. Um, I really emphasize exercise um, because um, I liken it to a ketchup bottle. When you, when you, to get things to move down in a ketchup bottle, you've got to shake the bottle. Same as the body. You've got to shake the body, get it moving for the, the bowels to move. There's a lot of other options available here, um, as I've noted here as well. There's also over-the-counter medications and different classes. Um, I, I tend to tell people to use more than one class of medication. Um, polyethylene glycol is, um, has the most evidence for it. Polyethylene glycol is also called peg flakes. The, um, the, one of the trade names is Restorelax in the grocery store. Um, and and it, it, there's not great evidence, but that's one I often recommend to my patients because there's, there, it seems that it has the most evidence to be helpful. And then there are a few prescription medications, um, but they aren't covered by the Ontario Drug Benefit Plan and they are very expensive and I haven't been all that impressed with them actually. Sexual dysfunction is also seen in people with Parkinson's disease. Um, and I've mentioned here, I'm, I'm, I think I'm on it, uh, I've only about not even 10 minutes left, so I'm trying to go a little bit quickly. Um, but um, both women and men could experience sexual dysfunction. And, um, and uh, the, these features uh, you can see on this slide. Um, erectile dysfunction is typically a late non-motor symptom of Parkinson's. And it's often not brought up by patients, but obviously can affect quality of life. People bring it up to me, I, I will refer them to a urologist, and uh, there are a lot of um, treatment options, as I'll mention, but there are a lot of things that cause erectile dysfunction. It's important to consider alternative causes as well, and these can be treated as well. So this is a list of different management options for erectile dysfunction, and um, in addition to lifestyle changes, most people, if they have to go far, they uh, go down this list, they get to the medications like Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra, and um, these um, can be very effective for erectile dysfunction related to Parkinson's. For women, it's not, um, it's not the variety of different options, unfortunately. Um, the goal here is to manage the motor symptoms, so these aren't contributing, as well as other non-motor symptoms that may be contributing to um, their sexual dysfunction and rule out other gynecological issues that may be playing a role. Um, temperature dysregulation um, is something that my patients um, complain of, and this is um, when you feel hot one minute and very cold the next, and you can sweat in public and it's very uncomfortable. It can be um, quite common, and um, it can actually, the excessive sweating can precede a diagnosis of um, Parkinson's by up to two to ten years. It can be in, in, very embarrassing. And it can be a symptom of wearing off, and so it's another one that it's important to um, pay attention to whether it's related to your medications wearing off, because uh, people can feel excessively sweaty during those times. Um, there, are, there are minimal treatments, like some of these um, issues, unfortunately. And I often counsel people to wear layers of clothing so they can remove and put things on as needed. Um, and then if it's related to the fluctuating um, response to medication, to change your schedule of medication to help with it. And there's some actually, um, data that shows that deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's may actually help with excessive sweating. So it's certainly not a reason to get this, this procedure, but it may actually help it. And um, I think this may be my last um, symptom, um, drooling. Now, drooling isn't really a non-motor symptom. It's, it's, it's related to um, not swallowing as frequently, and so people have saliva buildup in their mouth. But I, I added it here because we kind of think of it as a non-motor symptom in some way. Um, it is common later on um, and can be, um, can be, again, really bothersome for a proportion of people, typically about 15% of people with Parkinson's. Um, there are a bunch of different options. There are pills and drops and sprays that we can try to help with drooling because they dry out the mouth. But these treatments can affect thinking and memory. And because this is a symptom that tends to occur um, later in Parkinson's, some people have developed dementia and we can't use these types of treatments. Botox or botulinum toxin injections can also be helpful. This, this um, causes less saliva to be produced, and so it, it can make a big difference for some people. It's not covered by the Ontario Drug Benefit Program, I, which frustrates me to, to no end. They really think this is a major quality of life issue for some people, so people do sometimes pay out of pocket for this. 
Um, and then there's some evidence that external beam radiation therapy may help, but this is, um, I've really actually never seen this done for people at this point. Um, it may be something if someone has very severe problems and, um, and uh, nothing else is helping. So, um, inclusion, non-motor symptoms are really frequent and um, important symptoms of Parkinson's disease, and they concur at all stages, often um, later more than earlier, but um, certainly at, at any stage, and uh, some of them actually help diagnose Parkinson's disease. Um, treatment exists for some, and, um, and certainly it's worth discussing them with your neurologists um, if they're bothering you. Um, but of course, as you kind of, I'm sure you got from my talk, it's, it's really important that we come up with new therapies because some of them are not adequately treated at this point. Um, people ask me about stem cell transplantation, and there is work being done in this way to help these symptoms as well. Um, and, um, and in addition, there, you know, not, not only should we help find new medications to help treat them, but also to prevent them from happening in the first place. Thanks very much. And I'll be happy to take any questions. <laughs>